Okay, so, you know, a little bit about the Watership Council. You'd probably know that we speak for Northern Michigan's waters, and we do that through advocacy, education, water quality monitoring, and then re research and restoration. So volunteer programs are an interesting connection between water quality monitoring because you're out collecting data, and then the education piece of it where we train you to do these tasks, and then you can kind of share with um, the rest of the world, what you're learning, and you become a really great steward and ambassador for the Watershed Council. Here is our service area. Um, so some of these lakes that are coming online, I don't even see twin lakes on here. So we, I don't know who, I didn't make this map, but it needs to be a little, <laughs> little more detailed. It's a small so we got water. Really good, yeah, it is small. We've got really good representation throughout, you know, most of these lakes. <laughs> Paradise Lake is coming back. Um, I think we might get somebody on Lancaster. Most of these lakes are covered down here. So it's, it's really great how much monitoring uh, we do have in this area. So a little bit about our history. Uh, we have been around, the Watershed Council has been around for, I think this is the 42nd year. And originally this program started with just a little bit of Secchi Disc data collection. So we had some monitors out there with their Secchi Disc. And uh, it wasn't until 86 that we actually began coordinating a monitoring program. So in the beginning, it was just maybe a few people collecting data. Later on, we started to get more organized and train people uh, to collect data. And then we reported on it and uh, analyzed it. We added chlorophyll A in 1990. And by then, we had uh, 18 lakes being monitored. In 2006, we added dissolved oxygen, which I don't know if anyone still has our very old dissolved oxygen meters, but I know uh, some of the lakes have new oxygen meters and we're always available to help uh, with maintenance and calibration for those. So in 2006, we had 25 lakes being monitored and that was at 33 sites. So some of the bigger lakes have anywhere from two to four monitoring sites. Uh, in 2015, we added aquatic invasive species monitoring, and I kind of feel like that part of the program has been a little light, um, so we're hoping to have some new opportunities in the next couple of years to train people in aquatic or native plant ID, um, so look out for that, and I'll be sharing that um, if we do plan those events. And then last year, we started to add uh, total phosphorus to the program um, because some of the lakes in Antrim County, so Torch, Clam, and Bel Air, are actually part of the state's program, and the state didn't have a program last year. They started to work with us, and so we've added total phosphorus uh, for a few lakes, uh, just the ones that asked for it. Um, everything else is free. The total phosphorus, there's a, there's a small fee associated with that that the lake association usually picks up. So this year, what we're working on is, of course, training all of our new monitors, talking to our existing monitors, and then we're updating our quality assurance project plan. We are working on putting the data from the last 40-some years uh, into the CLMP database. And then we still, we actually have more lakes than we did in 2006. I think we're at 27 lakes this year. Uh, with 33 sites. So we are growing just a little bit. Uh, I think we have excellent coverage and I'm happy that we have so many uh, returning monitors. Okay, let's talk about what is the point of this program. Of course, we're trying to determine the trophic status and health of our lakes. So that's looking at is a lake really clear, which means it's oligotrophic. Is it more mesotrophic, which means it has a little more nutrients in it, or is it all the way in eutrophic or hypereutrophic, which means it has a lot of nutrients and maybe it has more water quality, which we don't really have any of those lakes, but we're looking for that. We examine trends over time, and I'll talk to you about what some of that looks like. And then we provide information to like associations. Uh, we provide it to the state. Sometimes the health department, um, we're working with a couple lakes on harmful algal blooms. So I'll kind of talk about how, how this actually helps us. And then we want to increase community participation in water resource education. 
Um, and so that's where you come in. You're the ambassadors for our lakes. And we, we love it when you, you know, talk to other people about how much fun it is. And then, of course, we can enjoy our lakes. I mean, we know that water quality is high here, but it is interesting to see, you know, some of the changes in the past 30 years. Um, it really helps us put those changes into perspective. You know, is it something that's totally different from what we've seen, or are we just entering a new cycle? You know, maybe it's something that repeats every 15 years. So those are the things that we can see. So here's a map of all of the lakes that were monitored. This is actually in 2019. Um, so we have to add some of the Torch, Clam, and Bel Air lakes. Uh, one of these lakes down here, Deer Lake. And I don't think Paradise Lake was monitored last year. So this is on our website. And if we have time, I will show you um, how you can just go to your lake and click on the data pretty quickly. I'll be updating this uh, this week probably. Well, those are all the lakes that we actually have monitors on. And here are some of the results from last year. Uh, so, you know, you collect chlorophyll A and Secchi disc, and those two things, we use them to determine the trophic state. And so everything in this blue category, oligotrophic, so everything from, let's see, pretty much Douglas Lake and Otsego County, all the way over to Torch Lake, the South Basin, those are all, those were all oligotrophic lakes last year. So that means they had pretty low nutrients and um, they had a lot of clear, they were very clear. So some of that can be due to, there's just not a lot of human activity around those lakes. Uh, it can, it might mean that they process those nutrients really well because they're really deep or they're really big, or maybe they have a really short residence time. Um, or it could also mean that maybe there's something else going on there, like invasive species, which are taking, you know, zebra mussels taking out uh, things like phosphorus uh, from the water column. So we've got a couple lakes in the mesotrophic category, and that's not, it's definitely not bad. It just means that they have a little bit more nutrients in them. They might have um, some different types of fish in them, maybe more like a, a lake that walleye would really like. Um, so they're just, a, just composed a little bit differently. They're farther along in their geologic history, um, but definitely, you know, we didn't see really anything bad last year in terms of uh, overall lakes, lake trophic status for the entire summer. And so these are all the ones that were monitored last year. So a little bit more about the trends. Um, so this is Torch Lake. Most of this data was actually collected under the state's um, CLMP program, you can see that it has really high total phosphorus in the summer. Um, and a, typically a lake like this, we'd want to look for something under 10 micrograms per liter. And you can see that it was up at 14. And this drop is pretty typical of a lot, lot of lakes in our area. And um, this one I thought just showed it really nice. And a lot of times that drop in phosphorus is due to zebra mussel filtering the water out or filtering the nutrients. Um, we even have some lakes where this has started to increase. So we can see that the lake is rebounding from those invasive, invasive species uh, colonization. So that's just one interesting trend, um, but it is very low, you know, since 2006. So this is very good down here. So here's an example of a lake that had some interesting things going on in it last year. This is Wallen Lake's North Arm. So this is pretty close to Petoskey. Um, so here's the sampling weeks. Zero would be uh, starting in June and then uh, September would be all the way here at the bottom. The samples that are taken in this blue area showed that the lake was oligotrophic, so very clear, not a lot of nutrients. And then everything up here at the top shows that the lake has more nutrients in it and it's more productive and can support more algae and more plants. And so this is showing seasonal changes on, on this particular arm in Walloon Lake all the way from 2013 to 2020. So each of these lines is a different year. And the 2020 line is this little blue one. But the main thing to see is that it starts pr pretty low here and then it goes up over time throughout the season. 
And that's pretty typical um, for what we've seen. And it just means that there's more, um, there's more production as the summer gets going. It's warmer, those plants and algae are able to produce more, there's more sunlight. And it's interesting because, you know, I might look at one of these years and I might think, oh my gosh, you know, while this north arm is eutrophic, what's going on there that's new? But when I see all of these trends heading that way, you know, I can say, well, that's actually pretty normal for that lake. What are some other reasons um, why it might look like that? And so we have this volunteer data, and then we also have our monitoring data. So we monitored this uh, stream. So the stream goes into the north arm of Walloon Lake. This is called Schuff's Creek. There's quite a bit of agriculture upstream, and there's a lot of uh, nutrients that come out of this stream. So we can look at um, the data that we collected from this stream and we can compare it to what our volunteer lake monitors are collecting um, because your data has, is much more frequent and it has a much longer time frame. So I can compare a few data points like from this stream to the long-term trends on the North Arm. And here's what the North Arm looked like. This is actually looking away from the North Arm. So this is looking out into the rest of Walloon Lake. And you can see how there's this kind of brown, brownish green line, line, yeah, line. Um, the whole basin, the whole North Arm was this green, brownish color. Um, and they said it looked like pea soup. So, you know, the next step is really for us to take the data that the Watershed Council has and use our volunteer data to talk to the state of Michigan about if there needs to be any more monitoring there and if they have any concerns um, for what might happen. I mean, I think that this area, uh, it's pretty, what happened in 2020 on Wildland Lake was actually pretty similar to 2013, uh, but it does look pretty scary, but it's our job to determine if these changes are, um, you know, based on human activities that maybe we can change, or is it just some sort of natural cycle in the lake? So we're working with the Lake Association um, to figure that out right now, but this is just one way that we can use the data that you collect um, to talk to the state and lake associations and come up with solutions to make sure that the lake isn't, you know, totally degrading in water quality. That's just an example of how that works. Okay, so a little bit more about what you are doing this summer. Of course, you're at the training today and everybody else is gonna be trained later this week. We want you to collect your Secchi disc um, starting in June all the way through August on a weekly basis. And then we will collect the data in the fall um, so that means your frozen chlorophyll A samples, your data sheets, and then we'll start inputting that into our database and the CLMP database. Um, I do not have the dates for when you can drop off your samples. Last year it worked really well, um, offering just a few a few dates. I do have an. I do think that we will be in the office by September. Uh, things are looking up, so we might be able to say, you know, just drop it off this week or something, but we'll we'll figure that out later on. Um, and then, you know, our annual report with all the results comes out in it's the spring newsletter, so I think it usually comes out in April. Um, I can always write individual reports for your Lake Association newsletters, and then all of our data and the charts are available on our web page. Um, I can show you how to access that. It was just put there sometime in the, in the last month. So it is up there right now. Can I ask a question? Sure, yep. Um, if we start collecting data in May or continue to collect it in September, is that information that would be simply discarded or is it is it useful? Who's asking that? I can't, I can't see who's Dean. asking that. This is Dean. Dean. Um, okay, that's a good question, Dean. So what we would do, and this is where I'm going to talk about the QAP a little bit more. We would still use it to, um, it would still be in our database, but I just would not use it in the calculation for the trophic status. 
And so that's just um, to compare from year to year, we only want from June to August. So you can start collecting the secchi disc data. The one thing I would not do is collect chlorophyll outside of that June uh, through August window, just because we have to pay for the chlorophyll A to be analyzed and that's an extra cost for us. Um, I, and I'm gonna talk about this a little more with this quap, but I am talking to uh, the CLMP folks and you know, I'm trying to get our program it's very similar to theirs. They start at the middle, in the middle of May and they go through the end of September, or sorry, the middle of September. And I'm considering extending our season to the end of September. So the idea right now of monitoring from June through August only is just for consistency of data. So that when somebody looks at our data set, they know everything is, everything is collected from June through September. Does that make sense? Sure, I understand totally. Um, it's just, okay. as, you're, as you're aware, um, you know, the water turns over sometime in, I think in June, and the, the water clarity readings are really quite different in May than they are in later June. So. Right. And from what I understand about the beginning of this program, it is mostly looking at the summer stuff. Mm -hmm. So if, if you, I mean, I guess what I would say is, it's okay to take secubus readings before June, but right now, the way that our quality assurance project plan is written, I only use things collected in June to create the calculations. Yeah, yeah I understand. That's fine. Sure. Okay. But it makes sense to me why we would want to start earlier. Mm -hmm. um, my only concern is uh, I know a lot of people either don't have their boats in that early or they're just not up north yet. Um, so we, that's something we can consider. I would just have to figure it out and make sure that it would work for everybody. Um, and there are some lists that do collect total phosphorus and that's another one that's really hard because we want it to be within two weeks of ice out and that's you know, this year, I mean, it came so early. I don't think anybody had a boat ready to go. Um, and it's also kind of dangerous to be yeah. boating, you know, early in the season, it can be windier, it's a lot colder. Um, so those are some things that I'm, I'm not gonna say all out, don't do it, you can do what you need to do, but sometimes I won't be able to put the data like in into the MyCore database is really what that comes down to. Sure, that's fine. So, Okay, and so this is the next thing we're going to talk about the quality assurance project plan, which was originally approved by my in 2015 and so what this plan says is it tells how we are going to train people what we're going to tell them and then what uh, what is the schedule for things. Uh, what are the holding times for these certain parameters, how exactly are they going to be collected. And the idea is that the program could be totally replicable. So like, let's say, you know, in 10 years, there is no volunteer lake program anymore. And in 20 years, somebody else wants to come along and take this up, they would have, they would be able to continue the monitoring exactly as we are doing. It. And so that's why this plan is important. It's, it's kind of a boring document. <laughs> um, but it does make sure that there is quality of data. Um, so that's part of the thing about, you know, making sure that your chlorophyll A samples are frozen, making sure that they are filtered in a dark room, turning them in with tin foil on them. Those are all things that make sure that the quality of the data is good. So if we deviate from that, we can still use it. I just have to write a comment to say, you know, this sample, if there's anything that looks weird with it, it could be because it wasn't stored properly. Um, or the secchi disk, you know, if, if it was really, really shallow reading, maybe the person, you know, took it outside of that window from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. They took it too late in the day. So those are some of the things that are in that plan. And uh, we do have a requirement that we should have to do some side-by-side -side sampling. And so on the right side of this, 
or I guess towards the middle, you can kind of see the little score sheet uh, that we're looking at um, when we would come out and do side-by-side -side sampling with you. And so these are all the things that you probably know, um, but I can also give it to you to check your own work. And so the first thing is, are you taking the measurement at the assigned location, the deepest point of the basin? So that's important, you know, to take the sample at the same place every time. Take it during the same part of the day, you know, over the shaded side of the boat. So there's little, you know, all these little details for each of these little samples. Those, if you follow those details, those are what make the quality of the data really good. Um, and then on our end, you know, we have to make sure that the bottle is, you know, everything is frozen as soon as it gets to our office. Uh, we keep track of when it goes to the lab, uh, when it comes back to the lab, you know, making sure that we actually don't lose your data. That has been a problem at the Watershed Council. I'm, I'm the first to admit it. And I'm also the first to say, you know, that I'm committed to making sure that what you turn into us gets online, gets in our database and the CLMP database. Um, and it's taking me a little bit of time to get everything organized. And, you know, we have quite a bit of data, but this is the year uh, that, it, that it is going to happen. So I'm excited about that. Um, I think that's it for the quality. So really just think about all these little details, you know, read your directions when we send you your supplies, make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to. And then, um, you know, we'll be able to say, yep, this person did a great job. They can, um, okay, somebody's asked me what lab is the Watershed Council using this year? We are using the University of Michigan Biological Station run our samples this year. Okay. Okay, back to the data acceptance. So this is the thing that Dean asked about. So for the trends, um, we do want to only use data collected between June and August. I can still, um, you know, when I do the reports to individual lake associations, I usually include everything. Um, and that's usually what goes in the database too. I just, when I make the charts is really the big thing. That's when I'm not gonna use anything before June. And so even if I change that quap, you know, I'll have to think about, well, should I be adding the May data in there? Because it might look a little bit different um, for those annual, basically. Okay, so at a minimum, we want you to take two secchi disc readings per month in June, July, and August, and one chlorophyll sample in June, July, and August. Um, ideally, if you take your secchi disc every week, and if you take two chlorophyll samples each month, that's like the, okay, you get a gold star. And that's what you'll find in your supplies. So everybody will have Depending on how many cc's you have to um, filter, you'll have um, usually, let's see, eight filters and seven test tubes. You really only need to turn in six test tubes with your filters in. So everybody has extra filters. You're going to have two to four extra filters. But the, um, the real number that we want to see you turn in is six. Maybe seven. Eight is probably is eight is probably too much. I think some people uh, take their chlorophyll more often uh, than every two weeks, and really every two weeks is that's totally enough. Um, we're not going to probably see a whole lot of changes every every week. Um, and so the other thing, it this one says on D, you must have less than a four week gap between measurements. Um, so like if you're going on vacation or something, you might want to get somebody else to monitor. And I, I know a lot of lakes are setting that up for this season where it's more of a shared task than just on one person's sh shoulders. Okay, so what happens if minimum requirements are not met? This kind of also goes back to Dean's question. So I will be able to look at the data and come up with, you know, maybe an you know an average trophic state for the summer, um, but I and I can possibly use it for the annual trends, but it will come with a little asterisk that says, you know, this data did not meet uh, the quality 
<clears throat> control requirements for a project plan. So, you know, basically take it with a grain of salt. It what it's not it's not the same quality as the rest of the data. Um, so if I do put it into charts and reports, it's going to come with that. Sometimes I do leave it out, um, and it may not be able to go into the CLNP database too. I've been talking to them about what what can and cannot go in there. So I'm trying to get those minimum requirements: two saggy disks per month, one chlorophyll per month. Question, uh, Christine. Sure. This is Jim. Yep. Uh, I noticed uh, the intermediate lake data is not in the base that was uh, put on your first slide up there, first or second slide with the, showing all the lakes. But we had discussed this last year, and you were tackling uh, getting it added. So, is it, are we yep. now included in, in uh, so that we will be shown on the database reporting? going forward you are jim yep okay. so there was no there was no intermediate data collected on in 2020 uh you didn't have any water quality monitoring so that's why it was on that chart that was only the 2020 lakes oh okay um, so the, yeah, the, but the other previous years prior years prior to 2020 previous were... years are in there they right. are in there if they okay. aren't you you gotta you gotta tell me hey where is this stuff so i've definitely been working with steve and some of the other lakes because you know i'm i'm like i know that you were out there monitoring but i can't i can't find it um and so that's you know we've had some transitions and i think some stuff got lost in translation but i think you know this coming year if i don't see your data you are going to hear from me so okay be prepared for that and it's totally okay, you know, some people, they, they didn't get to do all their monitoring last year. You know, they had other things going on. Um, so if, if it's the kind of thing where you only did half a year or two months, just let me know. And, you know, we can still use that data, but we'll just put a little caveat on it that says, hey, this wasn't a full season or something like that. So yes, okay. Jim, it, it should be in there going forward. Okay, so, oh, sure. Caroline, I have a question. Um, yes, yes. If, if we, for instance, if we decide to sample the first and third week of the months, is there is uh -huh. there advice on doing it on the same day of the week? I would say no, no, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't really matter, Steve. Um, okay. I can tell you that one, one other thing that I look at, and you don't really have to worry, but if you want to get really detailed, is we try to make sure that if you have two samples in June and three samples in July, that's okay. But if you had two samples in June and four in July, you know, that would mean that the July samples would be taking up a larger percentage of the season. And so I might, you know, reject a few of the July samples. So it's really try to okay. stay, you know, within one sampling event per month. So you can do, you know, okay. two in June and three in July and three in August or something, but we don't want to see one in June and four in July. That that's not going to be a good um, a good spread. So try to spread it out decently. Okay, is it so, possible? Is it possible to get ahead. copies of your slides for this presentation? Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely send yeah. this on. And this is the I, kind of the shortened one too. Okay. But I think this will help you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to minimize this. Okay, so two to three side-by-side -side sampling checks per summer. Um, I know that we are doing that on Douglas Lake in Sheboygan County. Um, I haven't really scheduled any others, uh, but if you are interested in having us come out and check your work, uh, it can be fun. It does not have to be serious. Uh, we'll just be making sure that everything is operating properly. Um, and that helps us make sure that the quality of the data is good. So that's one of our requirements in our CLAP, where we need to check a few people uh, each year and we'll use you as a representative sample um, for everybody else. But you know, in the next five years or so, I'd like to get out and, and see how everybody's doing on their lakes. Um, and so when we go out and do that, we go through that little checklist that I showed you and then we um, take a side-by-side -side sample 
So sometimes people ask me, is there any um, uh, replicate samples? And so that means that two samples are taken in the same way at the exact same time. And then we can compare the data between those two to see um, how accurate it is. And so we can, we can do that. We've done that before. Um, our lab will also do that where they will take two, you know, they'll take one bottle of water and they'll run two samples from it. And so that makes sure that there's not something weird going on with your monitoring or, you know, maybe there was something left over in your bottle or something like that. You know, we can, if it, if it comes back in the two samples that are done the same way at the same time are not the same, they don't come back within a certain percentage, then we would reject that and try to figure out why they weren't coming back the same. And so that's kind of just a little extra thing for us. Uh, if we start to check it, it, it is going to mean that we're going to try to figure out why, why it wasn't good. Okay, so I think we're getting towards the end here. And these are just a couple of reminders um, for some of the stuff that we received last year. Everybody is going to receive a data sheet and it will already have your lake name on it. So that's a big help. If you can put your name on it, that's also a big help. I mean, I'm definitely getting to know everybody, um, but sometimes I might have you know, somebody from our office enter the data or something and they might you know need to know what your name is um so put your name on your data sheet that helps me find you in case i have any questions um filter the amount of water that is noted on your label so when you start receiving your labels it'll say 60 cc's 120 cc's and 200 and or 240 cc's so that's the amount of water that goes in your syringe. If you're a lake that has 60 cc's, that means that you have enough chlorophyll A, chlorophyll A pigment in that 60 cc's for the lab to detect it. If you're at 120, that means that you have to filter twice as much water for the lab to detect that chlorophyll A. And if you're one of the lakes that has to filter 240, that means that you're very clear. There's hardly any chlorophyll A in there and they need that much water to be able to detect it. And so that volume of water is really important because they use it to come up with the um, final value for chlorophyll A. Um, and it's good that you collect more water because um, then they don't have to dilute anything. So it's a very, highly concentrated sample and so what they do is they kind of back calculate from that volume so so the volume is really important i know sometimes later in the season it gets too hard um to put you know as much water in those uh, vials and what i would say is if you if you decide to deviate from what it says on your label that's okay um, just make sure that you write it down on your data sheet. So your data sheet is really important for me to be able to check, okay, when did you do chlorophyll A and how much did you put in there? Because that information goes to the lab and it has a really big effect on what the value of the final chlorophyll A is. So that's really important is looking at the number of CCs on your label and doing what it says or letting us know if, if for some reason you can't do that. If for some reason it's wrong and that's not what you've done before, also let me know that. So we can go from there. Um, okay, so the filters, once you filter your chlorophyll A, you have to put it in those vials. The lab has told me not to fold them. So I don't know if, if we've been doing that, but they said you don't need to fold it. Just push it very far down into your vials, as far down as you can get it with those forceps. And so the idea with that is that they actually put, I think it's some kind of acid. It's the way that they analyze it. When they put that acid in those vials, it disintegrates the filter. And so I think it's easier to do when they're way down in there um, because remember they're frozen and then they have to thaw them out and put this acid or I don't even know what it is, some kind of chemical in there. So that's an important one. Don't fold the filters, put them down in your vials. Um, Okay, the chlorophyll A sample, don't take it more than 
let's see, clarif do not take clarifiable A sample more than once every two weeks. You should have six or seven vials total. Um, so that's what everyone's been given. And you do have extra filters. Don't worry about using them all. You know, those are extra in case you, maybe you accidentally fold one, one gets ripped, um, maybe it falls on the floor. You know, those would be reasons to just toss, toss those filters. If for some reason you run out, just let us know. We can send you a few more through the, you know, through the mail. That's not a big deal. Just be aware of that, um, that you do have extra filters. So use them, use them wisely though. <laughs> okay. And then wrap. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, since I've been doing this a while, I've accumulated additional filters. Is it still okay to use those old ones or not? Uh, it is still okay to use those filters. Yes. Yeah. As long as they, they shouldn't expire. Um, if for some reason they got wet or you had oil, you know, oil from your hands on them or they weren't stored correctly, that might be a reason. But if they've been dry, I, I don't see why you can't use them. Okay. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. Um, okay, wrapping tin foil around your amber vials. So the reason why those are amber colored and your chlorophyll A sample bottles are amber colored, we're trying to keep the light out of those because that chlorophyll A, it's the pigment from all that algae. And we wanna make sure that, that as soon as we take the sample that the algae stops photosynthesizing. And so that's why it's important to do the filtering in a dark room. <laughs> Keep everything, you know, in a cooler where there isn't any light, and then wrapping tin foil around your around your vials is just one more added <clears throat> layer. Make sure that they don't get any light. Okay, the last thing is if you are doing different sites, or if you have different lakes, is to put your vials for each of those sites in a different bag when you put it in your freezer. Um, that just helps me stay organized when I take stuff to the lab because otherwise I might have a Ziploc bag with 24 amber vials wrapped in tin foil and to unwrap all of those um, and, you know, make sure that they're all what they say they're supposed to be. It's just easier if you label the label a Ziploc bag with what's in there. You know, this is, these are the samples for Forge Lake south or something and these are the samples for deer lake if paradise lake had two different sites you know one would be paradise site east that's one bag paradise lake west is another bag so just kind of separating some of those things uh, helps us later on <clears throat> okay i think that is all i have i see some questions are there packing papers between the filters, like what CLMP supplies? So Becky, the packing papers, we've actually taken those out of the filters already. So everybody will be given uh, filters in a Ziploc bag. They should be white. Um, I have taken the packing papers out, which are blue, because sometimes it can be confusing. You might end up using a blue packing piece of paper as a filter and it's not going to work. So everybody will have a little Ziploc baggie of white uh, 25 millimeter um, filters. Okay, so the next question is, are there individual labels for the amber vials? Yes, yep, we've printed those out. You will have extra labels too. So I think you'll each have 10 labels for each site. Um, so you shouldn't need those, but if for some reason you do, they're there. It was just easier to print them out that way. Okay, here's another question. We can avoid losing data by making personal copies of our field notes with home printer or your cell phone. That is, that is very true. Um, some people I know like to collect their data and they use it or they put it in a spreadsheet. I can send uh, the spreadsheet to everybody. Um, and if people want to do that, that's fine with me. You can email your data to us so that you have it and I have it. And there's a record that shows, you know, you sent it to Caroline on this date. So that does help. Um, you know, either way is fine with me. We, our system now is when we collect your data sheets, 
they immediately get scanned into a computer um, and then they come to my office. So, you know, as soon as they get to our office, we're already making a second copy. And so I probably have probably about four, four or five different versions of all of your data uh, from the past few years. And that just helps me make sure that, you know, we can't lose it. So it's, it's electronic, it's hard. It, I've got a spreadsheet of it, um, but I can send out another spreadsheet uh, for everybody if you're interested in collecting it. Um, and putting it uh, electronically sooner rather than later. Okay. Carolyn, this is yep. Robin, Robin Rowe. I have a couple of questions about shallow water testing. Yeah. Because yep. I, I, I've both uh, between Larks Lake and Round Lake, um, that's been my particular problem, yep. expertise, I guess. Um, yeah. I, uh, Lark Lake, you've got me doing 240 uh, cc's on that. And um, okay. there, uh, question, one question is the amount of washing, uh, rinsing of the, of the various sample the, during the various sample protocols. Can, can, we, can, I, uh, can I take a second, uh, co collect uh, you know, a, a gallon jug of extra water um, it does from, you know, with, within two feet of the surface, or do I have to wash with a um, sample that's uh, representative of the full water column? Okay, so is your chlorophyll a sampler, it doesn't give you enough water to do the washing. Exactly. And the I mean, uh, I have okay. to be pre pretty, uh, okay. I have to uh, really, work with get, making sure I've got enough to make my take my Are sample yeah. as well as rinse. And yeah. Is 240, is that difficult for you to get through those two filters? Yeah, it can be. And that's the other thing because it's so okay. shallow. Um, uh, my Secchi dish basically can disappear into um, the, the marl on the bottom and uh, Get it all stirred up. Then, so I've, I've tried to to uh, avoid that. Um, there's no way that I can get my my water column um, two two times the secchi dish. Um, it's um, can't, so no. <laughs> um, that's not gonna let happen. me. I don't think we've sent your stuff out yet, Rob. Let after this meeting, I will double check if you really need to do the 240 first maybe we can drop it down to 120. Um, potentially, I think it would work to have the, an extra jug of water and just make sure that that's rinsed out with lake water um, because it is going to be all the same through and through because it's going to be well mixed. I don't see a problem with that. And then I would say in terms of the marl, I know we talked about that is, you know, maybe for the chlorophyll A sampler, I, I probably stop you know, maybe two, two, you know, one or two feet from the bottom, do not go twice the sucky disc. Um, so you'll have to kind of make a little adjustment there. But um, yeah, so that's an example, you know, Rob let me know last year, he said, well, I think I'm getting um, some substrate in my samples. And so that's a note that I have on, on the data that says, you know, if this looks like it's too high, it could mean that some of the sediment was in there. And so that's not a problem, but it does help when somebody's looking at this, you know, 15 years from now, and they might decide we don't want to use a certain piece of data because it has that note. So it's important for us to know if there's any changes that you have to make throughout the season. Art, I see you have a question. Yeah, uh, someplace years ago, I read in, in my literature that they were giving us that if you can't go to two times you you stop at three foot above the bottom and i've been doing that on clam ever since i started doing it um well as soon as let me put it this way i started doing that as soon as the zebra mussel showed up because then oh, my second okay. disc was i couldn't get to the bottom or i would stir it up like was mentioned i did have a question on the on going getting a column sample i was also uh -huh. taught that you could take the sample bottle and drop it immediately, you know, at free fall to the full depth that you have marked with your clothespin or whatever, and then draw it up at a constant rate 
and if you came out with the right amount of water in there, that was still a full column sample, rather than trying to meter it down and meter it back up. Oh, I see. Yeah, that that makes sense. But you're saying that you drop it down to two times the secchi disk? I don't. I go to three foot above the bottom in my case. But it you oh, I drop it. Case. I put it in. I put the, all the line down in the water. I hold it in my hand to the point. Well, I actually tie it to the boat too. And I drop it and it goes out to the full length at the speed that it could drop through the water until it is the line is taut. And then I immediately start drawing it up slowly until I get to the top. That's, and of course yeah. I can't be full and I can't be too, you know, too little right. of water. And I've got Our, that, yeah, that technique that, down. That's fine. Yep, that's fine. Yep, you can either fill that bottle partially on the way down and partially on the way back or just all the way up. That's totally fine. Yep. Okay, Bob Stetler. Yeah, could you review, because I've heard you say twice now, um, twice the secchi disc depth is what you sample for chlorophyll A, oh, which great. is yep. something that's entirely viable in Lake Charlevoix and not at all viable in in no lake. lake basically and then also no one like that that's not a very deep lake so it's sampling from the deepest parts you know i don't have a gps on my kayak so it's like i use landmarks right and i can so the depth can vary from right. 14 feet to 11 feet and, and i don't want to hit the bottom because i end up with schmutz and right. sediment and that kind of stuff in the sample yeah. so what's the protocol for you know sampling chlorophyll a relative to such a sucky disc yeah well, I would say for the shallow lakes, correct, you're not going to have a GPS um, or you're not going to have GPS in there. If you want to get really technical, I could come out there. But most of the time, if you're anywhere, you know, where you think you should be, the lake is going to be really well mixed. That's, that's if kind you're of in a shallow lake. Right. It varies, but it right. can vary within hundreds of square right. feet, right? So you'll probably still be getting a representative sample. The, the issue with the deepest place is like, let's say that you're in a, a lake with a really steep drop off. And for some reason, you aren't at that deepest spot. You know, you're, it's, the drop off is so quick that instead of being at 90 feet, you're at 60. I mean, that's where it, that's where it might be an issue. It, um, you know, whatever your return is on your secchi disc or something, it might be a little different. So on the shallow lakes, it's not that big of a deal to be right on. Uh, it, it really is about the depth though. So if you can try to get the same depth, that's good. And then Art, I think you're right about the three feet thing. That's on our checklist. So Bob, if you wanna just, you know, you, you might want to check the depth when you go out there and then only take the chlorophyll A sample up, you know, th three feet and above the lake bottom. Um, okay. Again, those, those shallow lakes are going to be so well mixed that, you know, just do what you can to get a sample that doesn't have sediment in it. It only has lake water. Sure, sure. So I'd say, you know, just watch the chlorophyll A sampler go down about halfway, let it down a little bit more, you know, use your tape measure or your rope to me measure that out and then lift it up, you know, and fill it. I also find that with the secchi disc that there's a element of subjectivity on the depth because in Charlevoix, uh, between 10 and 3, it is, it's not calm ever, right? And, and so... Right you're bouncing around in anything up to, you know, one to two foot waves sometimes, but always at least mm -hmm. you know, three to six inch waves kind of thing. So yeah. and that can make multiples of feet of different of what you judge to be when I can't see the disc anymore. How, I mean, any tips yeah. on that are useful, but it, to me, it seems like it's just a subjective call. It's like, yeah, it looks good. It is going to be subjective. And I would say, just make sure that you write on your data sheet the wave action and i think that you do already um and on a big lake like lake charlevoix a couple of feet is probably not going to make a big difference uh on now no one like you know that might um what else was i going to say the other thing about the secchi disc it is very subjective one extra little detail that you can do is decide at the beginning of the season if you're going to wear sunglasses or not when you're collecting your secchi disc, 
reading because that will change it. You know, if you have polarized glasses on, Absolutely. you'll be able to see it farther. So I can, I would recommend to wear polarized glasses if you've got them, um, but it doesn't really matter. Just whatever you choose, make sure that you're consistent throughout the season. Yeah, I, I do do that. But from the kayak, one of the things I, I guess I didn't recognize was the shadow side of the boat, which is easy from a 22 foot runabout, but from a kayak, there's really not a sunny side and the sun There's and the waves makes it real hard to be precise. Yeah. It's also hard to do when you're, when it's in the middle of the day. Um, so that's one of those uh, details. And, and I can tell you that that is the shady side of the boat is the protocol used everywhere, but it is difficult when you're in a kayak. So what I would say is, you know, turn your kayak, you know, perpendicular to the sun and do it over the opposite side of your kayak. That's kind of as I best would. as possible. But these it's aren't critical. So plus or minus a foot or two for any individual measurements going to get needed out in the Yeah. So we can say, you know, be looking away away from the sun when you are taking your sucky disc. Whether yeah. or not you can find shade on your boat, but looking away from the sun is the important part. I think that helps. Art? You know, I I played with this second. I have the same feeling. It's it's very subjective. And and, and I I did two day ways. And uh, I I did this when we uh, we were having the um, monitoring. You know the the second person checking on what we were doing. And we we had quite a long discussion on this. And if you have a, a you know a view scope like a tube with a with a clear plastic in the bottom. And I always looked at that and I said. You know, we're not supposed to use these. And I said, I said, I've experimented with it. If I put the th the secchi disc down and I work really hard at it, getting in the shade, keep checking it until I get just the perfect wave conditions, and all of a sudden, boom! I oh, I can see it. No, I can't see it now. Oh, there it is. And then you say, okay, that maximum depth. That's it. That's what I'm going to call because that's what I can see when the surface conditions aren't screwing it up. Right. And I always wondered, you know, if you put a view scope on it, you remove the surface conditions, which have nothing to do with what we're trying to measure. I never could figure out why that wasn't allowed. <laughs> How's that for you? Uh, yeah, that can be pretty complicated. So the, I wonder if it would help if I showed you what the cutoffs were for secchi disc in terms of oligotrophic, mesotrophic, um, because they're Pretty, I think it's, I mean, let me just find this pretty quickly here. <laughs> oh, that doesn't want to open. Okay, it looks like I it won't thinking, be able to yeah, I was thinking of along the lines <laughs> of, uh, it bothers me to have so much uncertainty in the measurement that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm trying to measure, which is the clarity of the water. It's the surface right. conditions, you know, and it changes from time to time. And I always wondered, maybe it's just not that important, but it seemed to me, we, you know, a system that would allow you to not have the surface conditions being the, a driving issue and getting a secchiness reading would be good. But every time I've seen it, oh, there's a few uh, things I've seen that says, well, you've got to tell us whether you use a, whether well, I don't know what they call it when you put surface lens down in the water, but I know, uh, you know, at Three Lakes, we were, we've to be doing things, we're working in the water. Becky got a really cool thing. She got a cat litter container. She cut the bottom out, she put plastic in it, sealed it off, and she has a lanyard around her neck. She just drops that down in the water, and boy, can you see the bottom <laughs> and work with it. Yeah. And, those, I mean, it, it's well. maybe it's beyond the scope of this, but it just always bothered me the science of that. Um, <laughs> I'm an engineer. I like things to be made as precise as possible if I can. Right. Well, I think the other main thing about the there, Becky's disc. Becky's got it up there. That you are the, you know, it, it, once you are monitoring for a while, it's all the subject, all the subjectivity is kind of taken out of it because yeah. it's, you know, your reading compared to what your reading was last last week or whatever and you, we know that you always do it the same way well so that's over, kind of yeah and over time it's just you know it's just statistically and if you average it for the whole year and that's the only number you use it's not going to make a whole lot of difference so 
I just thought okay. I'd throw that out. Yeah. Oh, I had another thought. question. Sorry. Uh, phosphorus. Okay. We should take that mm -hmm. as soon as we get get down to the lake to do that for the spring, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, correct. And, and the last one, should I do that with this, with the last chlorophyll or the last, or should I wait into September to do that? So right now is one of the questions that I have for the state. And I told them, you know, ideally I would want you as part of our program to take it uh, with the last chlorophyll reading. However, I'm asking them, you know, would they rather see us continue taking them in mid-September? Um, and they haven't responded to that. So I know that they're busy with the CLMP stuff right now. Um, so that's something that I'm, I'm trying to figure out right now. I would say for right now, our QEP says to take it with the last chlorophyll A sample. Okay. So we can stick with that. Um, your bottles should, I think they'll just say late summer and you'll just put the date on there. If they end up being in September, I'll probably still accept it this year. Um, but I'm hoping to get that nailed down, you know, in the next couple of weeks so that I'll have a, a more solid answer for you. I'm just kind of waiting for them to have the discussion with me. Okay. And we're taking it obviously well past two weeks to, for ice out. I mean, they still take it, right? I've talked to them about it. I'm not sure if they're going to take it, um, but I will still use it to assess the lake. So I can still okay. use it. Um, I think CLMP, I can't remember what they told me if they put it in the database, but they don't put it with the long term trends. I think that's like the only the only thing. Um, and they said, you know, ice out plus or minus. I can't remember if it was one or two weeks, but we're at one or two months now. <laughs> it's, it's the same for everybody. That, this is a hard, a hard uh, time to get out. And honestly, with with uh, these mild winters, you know, it might be hard for a while. But I would just get out and get it. I'll, I will still use it, and I'll work it out with CLNP. Okay, I'll put a date on it. <laughs> but yes, yeah, good. Um. Okay. So I think most of the samples, if they are supplies, if they haven't been sent out, some were sent out yesterday, the rest should be going out Thursday. Um, so you'll have your stuff uh, well before Memorial Day in June. If you want to start in June, that's good. Um, yeah, is there anything else? I will send I out- Can I check the address? Do you know, can I check uh, what address you're sending it to? Sure, do you want me to look right now? Yeah, if you would. Wait. Okay. Oh, I can't. It won't let me minimize Zoom. Um, let's see. I gotta connect to our system here. Because we transfer our mail and are heading up north here in the next few days, kind of thing. So. Okay. It could get lost in the interim. Let's see. Why don't you just have him tell you right now what address he wants it sent to? <laughs> okay, we've got. Do that. I don't even have it on here, Bob. I'll, I'll so have to. So, so it's the East Jordan, East Jordan address. It's. Yeah, yeah. That's the East Jordan address. All right, that's all I need to know. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yep. All right, any other questions or comments? <coughs> Carolyn? Who do I, who do yeah. I go to for uh, added equipment when mine wears out? I, I mean, I've been using the same drop can since, uh, well, in the 90s sometime. And yeah. uh, it's still hanging in there. I have lost at least one Secchi disc and I got it replaced that through Dwayne when he was doing it. And, okay. I, and my syringe is also about, it's pretty old. And I was wondering what, I mean, I'd hate to lose a sampling date, you know, if I didn't, if my equipment broke. Yeah, I can send you a new syringe and okay. I've got, I've got extra Secchi discs. So we can send you a new syringe. Um, I think the torch -like stuff already went out. So yeah. I will have to send that to you on your own. Um, but the clerk or the samplers, 
I think all the ones that I have made are going out this year with teams, but I can make you a new one if yours is in pretty poor shape. I will say that ours are also very old and rusty and we do need some new ones. Um, so I can make you new ones if you want new ones. Sometimes yeah. uh, people, their ropes will break or the wire and then their samplers at the bottom of the lake. So we've had to replace them for that reason too. Well, that's what I'm considering. I keep watching it, but it, you know the Secchi disc, you know, well that I, that was an odd situation that I lost that one. But anyway, I, that I'm, do, I'm doing okay with that. But uh, okay. and that if it got if I took me a couple of weeks to get another one, wouldn't be the end of the world. I would just hate to miss my chlorophyll measurement by that much. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we can definitely send you a syringe and probably a new filter holder too. Okay. Yeah. That would probably be nice to have that as a backup. Yeah. Yep. Mess it up. Okay. Uh, Tom, next. You're on? Yep, I'm ready for you. Okay. Uh, to go back to something you mentioned on slide one or two. Uh, okay. The Twin Lakes is a small lake, but the big bay is deep and the monitoring point is quite deep. Yeah. Uh, we have a special interest in oxygen monitoring. We have what I understand is one of the few surviving oxygen meters. Uh, it worked yeah. perfectly well through two years ago last year it became erratic and there's no replacement membrane. And I understand either we just drop it uh, or and give up monitoring for oxygen. Uh, or did I hear you say something about being able to help lakes? I can do that for you, yes. Okay. I have, I should have membranes and it probably needs new electrolytes. Um, I can definitely get it working for you again. And then what I can do is actually calibrate it against a machine that I know works. Um, so I can do that for lakes and we can either come over there or, um, you know, I'll be in that area this summer. So if you want me to stop over there sooner rather than later, I can't remember if anyone from Twin Lakes is coming on Thursday. I don't yeah. believe so. I don't think so. Okay, so let's set up a time where I come help you uh, maintain that because I can do that for you. Excellent. Okay, that would be great. Okay, any other equipment needs in the, you know, the non-consumable stuff, the, the hard stuff, everybody's sexy discs are in good condition. We can always repaint them or give you a different one. We've got some newer, newer looking ones, ropes, tape measures, syringes, filter holders and dissolved oxygen meters. So the new dissolved oxygen meters, I can calibrate those too. Um, and so I work with Intermediate Lake on, you know, how to store them and, and um, what kind of maintenance they need throughout the year, which isn't much. The new ones are a lot easier, but the old ones, I can still get those working. And that's only specific to a few limited lakes or lake associations, DO? Yep, just a couple ones, they either um, have a machine that they're borrowing from us, which I do have a few more. If anybody's interested, I can provide training on that and, uh, and loan you a piece of equipment. Um, and then a couple lakes have purchased new ones, newer ones. Mm -hmm. Caroline? Caroline Association? Who, uh, who asked that, Bob? I, yeah, like, do you work with the yeah, lake I, Association? Yep. Yep, we, we meet with them on different stuff all the time. So yeah, we we work with them quite frequently. Yeah. You want me to talk them into buying you a dissolved oxygen meter? You know, the lakes, I don't think has a DO problem. So it's, you know, it's kind of, you want to spend the money, sure. Right. 
Anybody, anybody else? Any other questions right now? Caroline, last yeah. last summer there was talk about um, nutrient uh, testing both phosphorus and nitrogen. I've not heard you say anything about nitrogen. Steve, I put um, sample bottles, or I think your sample bottles will say phosphorus and nitrogen for intermediate legs. Okay. So we'll talk about that. You're the only other lake to ask for that. Um, you know, phosphorus is kind of the more important nutrient, uh, but nitrogen can be good to monitor. And so that's kind of outside of the program, but obviously we okay. can add it. So your monitors will be testing for that and intermediate lake will be charged for that. It's the same price as total phosphorus. So I think instead of, you know, 16 bucks, you'll be paying 32 or something like that. Okay. I Good can enough. bring those Thank costs you. on Friday. Yeah, and we can do that. Okay, well, I'm always available um, to help, and I'm you know excited to help bring back the old equipment. I really like doing that. Um, so yeah, if you need anything, let me know. I'll be in touch with Art about a new syringe and filter holder and maybe a new sampler. And I'll talk to Tom Knox about um, getting a time to calibrate the dissolved oxygen machine and uh, maintain it so that it's actually working. Hmm. Anybody else have any similar needs? Okay. Well, I think we're all set. I really appreciate you you all taking the time today um, just to meet up once this summer. And I appreciate the fact that you're all willing to go out there once or um, once a week or once every two weeks to get this data. You know, it really helps us put into context some of the other work that we do. And for some lakes, it's the only monitoring they'll ever see. So it really does add a lot of value. Um, and, you know, it, it takes away a lot of the mystery for some of these lakes, you know, you can, you, you're able to show us what's actually going on um, with the data that you collect. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank All you. right, have a good rest of the week, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.